Hi, I'm Nora Dunn, and I'm otherwise known as the Professional Hobo. In September of 2021, I spoke at an event called Camp Indie. My speech was called How to Manage Your Finances Like a Location Independent Superstar, and they've kindly allowed me to repost this talk here. Camp Indie was hosted by Location Indie, which is a community of people who love travel, building online businesses, and connecting with others who get it. They feature a private social network, expert workshops, exclusive monthly events, expert training on both travel and business topics, in-person meetups, mastermind matchmaking, and much more. I've been a part of the Location Indie community for a number of years now, and it's a pretty tight and supportive group. I personally always make a point of attending the co-working and accountability sessions. I've also collaborated with a lot of people in this community and pretty much everybody I've hired, both contractors and employees, have either been community members or referrals from these people. But what really solidified my love of the Location Indie community was attending Camp Indie. Conferences in general are incredibly instrumental in networking and collaborating with like-minded people. I wish I'd clued into that a lot earlier in my career, but that's another story. Camp Indy was all the more special because it was like summer camp for adults. It was hosted at a facility that caters to kids during the week and adult groups on the weekend. So we had the full money of activities, ropes courses and water skiing and bungee trampoline and floating water playground, as well as speakers, workshops, parties, and an open bar. Now you will notice in this speech that I swear a little bit, not any ha anything hardcore, but you know, you'll see, you'll hear the four letter S word a few times. I don't normally swear when I'm speaking at conferences, but this was a casual event. And after attending the weekend with these folks, it was appropriate to the mood. And I got a few laughs with some strategically placed cursing. So without further ado, please enjoy my talk on managing finances like a location independent superstar. Uh, it is a great honor for me to get to introduce our next guest because 12 years ago when I was a high school teacher in a school where kids were not um, really into academics and I was getting desks thrown at me and expletives thrown at me every day or every class period, I was like, well, this, this kind of sucks. Um, what could I do? What could I do different? And so I went down the rabbit hole of the internet and I found this site called The Professional Hobo and you know, I was like, this is amazing. And I sent it to all my friends, and they're like, this is weird. Like, Hobo? Like, you know that means homeless, right? It's just a nicer version of homeless. Like, yeah, this is awesome. And I started reading everything on that site. And I was like, there is someone out here doing it and, and writing about it and being honest and open about the good times and the bad times and everything in between. And that was one of the first times that I thought, oh my gosh, I can make a life happen that doesn't have to be normal. And so, you know, basically I said, well, when I grow up, I wanna be like Nora. <laughs> and I am certainly not as witty, um, I am certainly not as fun, I am not as good of a dancer, but between Jay and I's powers combined, we were able to convince Nora to come and speak at Camp Indy. So, Nora, thank you so much for inspiring me, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people over the year to lead an unconventional life through your writing and everything you've been doing. So thank you so much, and it is a great honor to have you here at our very first Camp Indy. Awesome. First of all, I have to just say, how amazing has this weekend been? How unbelievable is this as a conference to be able to have summer camp, to be able to have all these amazing speakers, to be able to spend all this amazing time doing epic bonker shit with one another all weekend. This has been a great mix of work and play. And I think that this is a really interesting metaphor for what the location independent lifestyle can be like. It is that mix of work and play. And I'll tell you what, it's also a double-edged sword, but we'll get there. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about managing your finances to be a location independent superstar. Now I have another title for this talk. Actually, it's called LIFS Made Easy, which is location independent financial shit made easy. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to give you a bit of a shit sandwich today. As we're going to have two acts with like a meta transition. And the first act is the inspirational shit, because that's, you know, on a Sunday morning we have to start somewhere. <laughs> and then I'm going to get all meta on you, and then we're going to go into the practical shit. 
Now there's something that's really interesting when I was developing this talk. Uh, I realized that I had made an assumption about the location independent lifestyle by virtue of who I am and what I've done. And for me, location independence is is the freedom of lifestyle. And for me, that freedom of lifestyle took the form of, in 2006, I sold everything that I owned, including a busy financial planning practice, in order to embrace my dreams of being able to travel the world long-term and in a culture, culturally immersive way. So I was proverbially homeless for 12 years. And I traveled around the world, living in and traveling through about 65 different countries. Since then, I've spent the last three years since then with a home base. And I continue to travel as and when and for how long that I wish. So I have a broad range of location independent experience in terms of how to be the architect of the lifestyle that you want. <coughs> what this means for this talk today is it's gonna be real travel centric. <laughs> and because what I do now is I'm paying forward all the mistakes that I made, which were many, and I'm helping people set up their lives, their lifestyles, and their finances, because the financial planner in me never died, to be able to travel effectively, confidently, stress-free, to make sure that you're planning for the future but not at the expense of today, and to do it all like a location-independent superstar, and to live like a rock star on a pauper's budget. <laughs> I know, right? I generally told myself, I have champagne, champagne tastes and a beer drinker's budget. <laughs> I have it right now. So first we're going to start off with the inspirational shit. And what I want to do is I want to debunk a couple of myths about the long-term and full-time travel lifestyle. Also, guys, we're kicking this workshop style. So if you have any questions, if you want to, like, let's make this a conversation, put your hand up. I also have a ton of stuff to talk about today. So the one caveat I have is if you want to ask a question while we're in this and have this conversation, make sure that whatever you're asking is directly related to whatever it is that I'm talking about. <laughs> because I'm a rabbit hole sort of girl and this is not going to go well if, if you get me off track. Uh, but I will make sure that we have time at the end for all kinds of questions. And I'm here all day. I said, like, I'm here all week. <laughs> so let's debunk a couple of myths about the full-time travel lifestyle. First of all, how many people here would like to travel full-time? Awesome. Okay. How many people here would like to maintain a home base but be able to travel long-term? All right. I feel like we just caught everybody in the room in one of those two categories. So great. This means that I'm not completely irrelevant. What are some of the ring? What are some assumptions that you have about this lifestyle? It's easy. It's easy. It doesn't wow. cost very much. <laughs> Hold on, wait a minute. You're just, you're messing me up here. You guys are going the wrong way. You're, it's easy and it doesn't cost very much. What I have here, <laughs> it's expensive and complicated. Guys, get it right. <laughs> you're messing me up here. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad some of you think it's easy and inexpensive. For those of you who think it's complicated and expensive, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to, do, there's, a, there's a really big differentiation between what we generally think of as travel, which is usually considered a vacation, and lifestyle travel, where you are traveling and you are working at the same time. Two very, very different things. Right? When you're on vacation, you have time off. You're not working. You're spending your money and you're going to a location and you're doing epic bunker shit every single day. And it's really expensive, right? For a week or two, you're spending thousands of dollars. You probably, if you did it right, you need a vacation to recover from your vacation. <laughs> so then if you extrapolate that, those two weeks across a year, you think, there's no way this is affordable. How could this possibly be affordable? But the good news is, if it is a lifestyle, it is completely different. And the way you engineer and create that lifestyle is completely different. I'm going to show you some ways to make to, that, that it will be inexpensive. And I'm going to show you some ways to keep it inexpensive. The other thing is it's complicated. That's not a myth. It's complicated. But it doesn't have to be insurmountable. Right? So what do you do for residency? How do you get your mail? How do you open a bank account in a country? Spoiler alert, you don't need to. How, how do you do this, right? How do you manage all these logistics? It is possible you will get into that groove. There's definitely a few things to learn along the way. Uh, and if you like, you can hit every bump on that learning curve like I did. 
it's a learning experience. Um, but you don't need to anymore. And we're going to talk about that in the whole meta section. So. I want to talk about what financially sustainable travel is. I very inadvertently coined this term, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And it's not about budget travel, and it's not about being environmentally sustainable. Those are the two misconceptions people have when you hear financially sustainable travel. Financially sustainable travel is based on three pillars. Earning money remotely. This could be a lot of money or it could be a little bit of money. It could be passive income, it could be active income. Second pillar, making creative, conscious spending choices with that money. And we'll talk about some of the ways that you can be creative and conscious about that. And the third pillar is being able to balance the two so you can travel for as long as you want. Pretty easy, right? You have money in, money out. Make sure that you're not spending more than you're earning. And you're good to go, right? <laughs> I was shocked when I, I actually tracked uh, and reported and published my income and my expenses for 10 years because I wanted to prove that full-time travel could be financially sustainable. And I shocked myself. In the first two years that I tracked my expenses, I traveled full-time for $17,000. And like it was exactly the same, those two years. I didn't, I didn't make that, that wasn't on, on purpose. My total annual expenses, business expenses, insurance, transportation, everything I spent was $17,000 for a year. How much money do you spend on rent or a mortgage in a year? Probably that much, if not more. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't always need to cost $17,000. You could also spend $17 million, right? Again, money in, money out. You make that choice. If you want to make more money, then you can spend more money. It is entirely up to you as to how you design your travel lifestyle. If you want a home base, that's going to cost you a little bit more because you've got these home expenses while you're traveling full time. Or so part term. I have that home base now, right? So I, I actually, when I started traveling, I was like, I'm never going to get a home base again because it costs way less to live on the road full time than it does, ever did for me to live in one place. I'm eating those words now, I have a home base. But I made that choice. I decided it was time for me to do that. Not only from a business perspective, but a personal perspective as well. You have that choice every step of the way. For me, that was really difficult to give up that part of my identity, right? Yeah, I'm the professional hobo, right? I'm supposed to be homeless. It was a bit problematic for me. But I'm okay with it now. And this is the beautiful thing about the location independent lifestyle. You can decide how, it, how you want it to look. And you can redecide. And you can iterate that over and over again. And it's entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. <laughs> you can go, sing it, sister! <laughs> um, let's talk about how you can keep some of those costs low. Let's talk about how I actually managed to travel full time for 17 grand a year, shall we? <laughs> the first way to save money. First of all, what is the most expensive aspect of traveling? Lodging. Lodging. Accommodation. Hands down, that is the most money that you are going to spend, is on your accommodation. Especially if you think of what a hotel costs. Well, there's good news. There's a couple of different ways. First of all, when you travel as a lifestyle, you're not going to be staying in hotels for the most part. You're going to be staying in longer term places. You're going to rent a place for a month or a couple of months. Or you're going to do what I did for the first 10 years, and you're going to save over $100,000 on accommodation expenses by getting it for free. I wrote the book on it. I'm just saying. <laughs> there are a bunch of different ways that you can get free accommodation, and I discovered this along the way. I had no idea. There are actually five ways you can get free accommodation. You can get it through volunteering, work exchange. You can get it through house sitting, which is excellent for if you're working along the way. You can get it through hospitality exchanges. You can get it through living on boats. I actually lived on boats in the Caribbean, not a night on land for two and a half months. Three countries, five boats. That was interesting. And the last way is through home exchanges. So if you actually do decide to keep a home, you can use it as collateral to be able to stay in other amazing places around the world. If you can save that money on accommodation, you're already way ahead of the game you will already inherently be spending way less to travel long-term or full-time. Now, there are goods, there are pros and cons to that, right? Because again, if you're running your business, I found this, this out the hard way. The first couple of years I was volunteering in trade for free accommodation, 
And then I, you know, I'd be like volunteering five hours a day and doing great stuff. And then I'd be like, I'd go to my room and I'd hide out on my computer and I'd work for another five hours a day. And suddenly I was like, did I just trade one rat race in for another? Because I have no idea where in the world I am right now. It's kind of inconsequential. So it, again, it's, it's up to you to make the decisions as to how you want to balance that work in life. For me, that didn't work out so well. House sitting worked out real well for me. And you guys are welcome to ask me any questions about how to get free accommodation. Uh, I'm an open book. I'll give you a free copy of my book if you ask me nice. <laughs> there we are. Okay, another way to travel very inexpensively and live like royalty. Frequent flyer miles. I categorically travel. When I fly long haul, it is almost always in business class for less than the price of an equivalent economy ticket. That's how I roll. <laughs> Warning, once you've experienced business class, That's it's right. real hard to go back. <laughs> I'm just saying. We will talk about some ways to do that, but I, you know, Trav, when we met, you were the frequent flyer around guy. And you help people do all of that. And I, did, I still remember that. So you're, you're the expert here on, on, on a lot of that. But I think there's a lot of people who know how to do this kind of stuff. And it's just, a, all that information is out there. And again, ask me all kinds of questions, but we'll talk about it in the practical shit a little bit too. Third way to travel very inexpensively, travel slow. Now this is gonna serve you in a lot of different ways, but just right off the top, the fewer planes, trains, automobiles, tuk-tuks, scooters, fans, <laughs> rollerblade, whatever it is, the fewer things you get on, the less money you will spend. And also the less you move around, the less money you'll spend. As an example, let's say I have a house sitting gig in destination A, and then maybe I have another house sitting gig in destination B, but because I'm moving from A to B, I'm gonna need to obviously pay for the transportation, but then I'm also gonna probably need to, uh, a couple of hotels you know, on the way out and on the way in. I'm probably not gonna be able to go from one free night to another free night. Uh, if I'm moving from Airbnb to Airbnb, you know, maybe I like to cook meals. <laughs> if everything I own it fits into a bag, I ain't going to be carrying a bunch of groceries with me either, right? So then you're going to be eating meals out until you can populate your fridge again. There's always going to be money spent every single time you move. The other thing is, <laughs> it is completely unmaintainable if you're working while you're traveling full time. I discovered this one the hard way. I think it was 2010. <laughs> I moved so fast. I traveled, I, the longest I stayed anywhere that entire year was two and a half weeks. On average, I moved beds every five days. I needed six months in a comatose state to recover from that one, right? So that was, that was the year of, okay, that, don't do that. But I'll also tell you, because most of my accommodation that year was for free, I literally, that year I spent $173 on accommodation wow. for 365 days. And that 173 bucks was a splash out of the Hilton in, a, in Stockholm. <laughs> hey, you gotta live well, right? Travel slowly, set a pace. If you think one month in a destination is long enough, <laughs> you may actually want to make that even longer. But again, it's up to you, right? You can set that pace. You can figure that one out. You can travel fast for a little bit, and then you can travel slow for a while. You can travel fast, and then you can come back to your home base. You get to do it as you wish. But the slower you go, the less money you will spend. Hmm. Another way that you will save money when you're traveling long-term or full-time is when everything you own or everything you're carrying with you fits into a bag. Guess what? You can't buy anything. <laughs> Consumerism is a complete non-issue, right? Unless, I mean, I, everywhere I went, I had to really think very hard about whether or not I wanted to buy something because it had to replace something that I already had in my bag. So it had to be really good. As a result, actually, it's kind of interesting because all of my clothes, like everything I own is like a souvenir from some other place. Because if I did buy something, it had to be immediately useful every single day. So that's kind of cool. But you will inherently spend less money when everything is in a bag. Now, it's all wonderful that we're talking about keeping costs low, and we're talking about being able to, to travel on a, a pauper's penny, shall we say. But the financial planner in me would be remiss not to say, hey, wait a minute, you gotta also kind of save money and take care of your financial future, mm -hmm. right? You don't, nobody plans to fail, but a lot of people fail to plan. And no one is gonna take care of you in the end other than you. And the, the power of compound growth is pretty spectacular. 
if the earlier in life, the more money you save, the more money it will become when you are either unwilling or unable to work at the pace that you're working right now. And if you go like, oh, Nora, you know what? I'm going to work until I drop because you know what? I love work and all that. <laughs> yeah, power to you. Guess what? That's probably not going to actually happen. So make sure somewhere in your financial planning, you are taking care of your future. You are making those investments. And we will talk about that a little bit if we have time. Like I said, I got a lot of stuff to talk about. But now it's time to go meta. <laughs> what is this new world that we live in? <laughs> is that a good laugh? I don't know. But you know what? Actually, there's a lot of opportunity happening right now. So there's a revolution happening right now, and it's called the remote work revolution. And we are all on the leading edge of that. Like, I thought there was a wave, like, I don't know, five or ten years ago when more and more people started jumping on the location independent bandwagon. That was the ripple. Now there's a wave. The pandemic has necessitated that most of the world basically go remote or become obsolete. There are millions upon millions upon millions of people whose jobs and careers have now been made remote. And on the other side of this pandemic, many of these people are going to be able to continue to be remote and many of these people are going to start to embrace the travel lifestyle. But what this means for all of us, we're all trendsetters now, eh? That's pretty cool. I am not a trendsetter. If, if anybody last year, who here last year was on the Camp Indy, like our, our virtual Camp Indy? Who was here? I talked about high-waisted pants, and now I'm just not that, like, fashion trends. I just, I don't jump on any trends. The fact that I happen to be on the leading edge of anything is like a total accident, I'm just saying. <laughs> But what this means for us is because now we, there is a remote work revolution, there are all kinds of opportunities. There are systems that are being put in place. There are ways, there's software, there's programs, there's companies that are being developed in order to make the location independent lifestyle easy, cheap, fun, possible. And it's only going to get easier from here on in. Now I have good news and bad news as well about this. What do you want first? Okay. As a digital nomad until now, you fit into a gray area when you're traveling to another country. Right? So it's like, okay, so I'm not doing a job in the country that would necessarily, you know, be something a local in that country could do. So I don't need a work visa. And I'm not doing business with anybody or any companies in that country, so I don't need a business visa. Well, that the only thing left is a tourist visa. So I mosey on into a country and they'd say, oh, you know, what do you do and why are you here? And I'm like, oh, I, uh, I'd be pretty quiet about why I was here. But there's, the reality is there's no reason, there was no other visa I could get, right? And digital nomads and remote workers are, as we'll see shortly, are being welcomed with open arms. I mean, why wouldn't a country want us in there? We are earning in foreign dollars. We are bringing those dollars into their country and we're spending it locally. Glory, hallelujah. Right, so I had no qualms about traveling on tourist visas. Again, it was the only option, really, and it was all good. Now, the rest of the world is caught, because we're in this remote work revolution, the rest of the world is caught up to the idea that, that we're pretty cool and that we should be staying in their country for long periods of time. So now there are all these remote work and digital, and digital nomad visas. Here's the problem. They're expensive, some of them, and they require a lot of paperwork that self-employed, location-independent people might struggle to provide, like proof of income. Mm -hmm. A lot of these countries don't really understand that what they really want in their bureaucratic minds is a pay stub. They're looking for remote workers, telecommuters, the people who have jobs, who can say, hey, look, I make this amount of money every month without fail. Not a lot of people in this room are like that, right? We're, we're self-employed, we're starting up our own businesses. Like, how do you prove your income? And how do you prove the sort of income that they might be looking for? So the problem now becomes, and I don't know, I don't know how this is gonna roll out. I think this, is, this will eventually be ironed out, but for the moment, the problem becomes, well, hold on, wait, if I, if I wanna go to a country now that has one of these visas, but I don't wanna get the visa, can I still get in on a tourist visa? Is immigration going to scrutinize me a lot more? Maybe. So who's to say? Like I say, I think this is going to get worked out. 
Now, the good news is there are location independent and digital nomad and remote work communities everywhere. There are fabulous opportunities to live and to travel and to network with other people who have the same lifestyle. And this is incredible. This is an incredible opportunity and this is something that I didn't have and actually ultimately led me to burning out of the lifestyle entirely. Because I didn't have my people. You guys are my people. We have an amazing community here. And we can meet in amazing places around the world. There are other communities as well. There are opportunities that make travel really easy for us. Remote year, hacker's paradise, outside, Wi-Fi tribe. All of these places where you can do nomad cruise. There are all kinds of ways that we can now mix with other people who have the same lifestyle as us. It makes travel and life so much easier. I mean, if this weekend alone is any example, we've had some amazing opportunities to network, to learn from one another and also just to have a lot of fun with one another too. <laughs> now, there's a whole bunch of practical shit we can talk about as well. I mean, I could use the whole day, I could literally spend a whole day talking about how to use an ATM abroad. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, and, I, and I know that we have a lot of amazing stuff to do and we've got other speakers to hear from. So I need to skim through a lot of this, but this is where I want to put it into you guys. We can talk about insurance, we can talk about banking, we can talk about taxes, we can talk about investments. The one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one really important piece of advice, and it goes into what we were just talking about. You guys, if you're getting your location independent business started and all set up, don't do what I did. <laughs> what you should do is set up a separate bank account right away. Okay, you can be operating business under your own name. It's fine, it doesn't have to be a business bank account. It just needs to be a separate bank account. If you are registering your business as a sole proprietorship or, or any other format, then obviously you'll need to set up the bank account so you can receive payments as that name. But if, as a sole proprietor, if you're just earning money as your own name, you might be tempted just to bring the money into your personal account. The problem is, eventually, if you want to demonstrate that income so you can get that digital nomad visa, or if you want to buy some property and show that you, you know, you'd want to get a big loan or a mortgage, you need to be able to demonstrate that income in the bank account is going to be the first way to do that. And then you can pay your expenses out of that account as well. So that's my first really big financial practical piece of advice. Does anybody have any specific, or do you have any burning questions about how you might do taxes, bank accounts, any of this kind of stuff? Save currency conversion charges abroad. <clears throat> what do you need? Does anybody, bring it on. What yeah. sort of insurance do you recommend? Brilliant. Uh, I think somebody on Jason's podcast uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago said the most brilliant thing, which is if you cannot afford insurance, you cannot afford to travel. Do not be that person who says, oh, if I get sick or injured, I'm just going to crowdfund. I will unfriend you and block you if you do that. <laughs> Right? You remember what I said earlier, take care of your financial future? Also take care of your financial present. You need insurance. Thank you for asking. It all depends on your citizenship as to what specific type of insurance you want or can get. But I'll get, there's two different, two main types of insurance. One is travel insurance. Right? This will take care of a medical emergency and it will also take care of things like um, cancel you know, if you lose your bags or if, uh, you know, you, get COVID and you have to cancel a flight and quarantine in a hotel, right? The insurance will take care of those kinds of expenses, but they won't take care of routine medical expenses. International health insurance, also known as remote health insurance or expat insurance, they're all kind of the same thing. That is like basically having a health insurance plan that will follow you around the world. It will inherently cost more. Um, and depending on your nationality, like for as a Canadian, I could only qualify for travel insurance for a certain amount of time, and then I had to get the international health insurance. Um, but I didn't, my, one of the things you'll find is when you travel the world, actually routine medical expenses are gonna be categorically less expensive everywhere else than here. So you can probably self-insure for a lot of that stuff as long as you make sure that you take care of your, uh, um, as long as you make sure that you take care of the big medical stuff, right, the medical emergencies. That's the stuff that you really need to, that's the stuff that will bankrupt you, even in Cambodia, <laughs> if you're not prepared for it. So definitely let me know. I can talk to you ad nauseum about it. Travel insurance policy and then also like a, 
health insurance? Good question. Okay, so he asked if there's any specific uh, companies that I would recommend. The company that I'm using right now that I really like is called Safety Wing. And they have both. They have the, the Nomad insurance, which is basically the travel insurance, and they also have the remote health insurance. Uh, it's, it was developed by Nomads for Nomads. Uh, the coverage is pretty good. Again, I go, I go deep into that. I wrote a huge article on my website on exactly you know, how that compares to other companies and whatnot. So, um, but it's not the only company out there. I've had about five or six different kinds of insurance. Uh, and, uh, but right now, Safety Wing is taking care of me. If I fall off this stage and go to the hospital, Safety wing has my back. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? J. Rob. So pay attention to pre-existing conditions. Okay, so he just published an epic article about exactly that, about, about pre-existing conditions, uh, about any members of the LI community go into the forum because that I read that article before I came here and I just thought that was epic. It was such a good article um, and definitely required reading. Because things like pre-existing conditions, things like traveling, not everybody is 100% healthy when they hit the road. And it, it can be problematic when it comes to making an insurance claim. Just so you know, like I'm a huge advocate of insurance, but I've also had to make insurance claims. And I will tell you that the insurance company's job is to try to get out of paying you. <laughs> there are ways to make sure that you do get paid. But it, it does take a lot of work. All right, we have time for one more question. Oh, I was just going to kick in. I know those of you who are considering me. Thank you for bringing that up because international health insurance, if you're a U.S. resident or citizen, it will, it will not cover you if you spend a certain amount, more than a certain amount of time here. Like, it, depending on the insurance company, you might only be able to spend a month stateside and have that coverage. So you do, if you are going to spend money stateside, you do need to spend time stateside. You will need to have a different kind of insurance, and that I am not an expert on, but... There are people in each state who are qualified to sell you where, like, your home base or address would be. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. You know, it's interesting because the insurance policies actually, depending on the kind of insurance you get, especially when it comes to international health insurance, they'll say, do you want coverage including the U.S., Hong Kong, and Singapore, or the, yeah, then we're going to triple your rates. Yeah. Do you want coverage without those countries? Are you going to stay out of those countries? Great. You get a deal. And it's because of the cost of health care here as well. Generally speaking, in my experience, categorically pre-existing conditions are not covered or they're not immediately covered. So the fact that you've found some ways around that is fabulous. What, <laughs> what J-Rob has done to find this out is he's read a lot of fine print, right? He has sifted through pages and pages and pages of legalese to figure out what the insurance company will and will not cover and how you make a claim. And guess what? If you want to actually eventually make that insurance claim yourself, you're going to need to do the same thing. It is soul destroying. It is very important. Whatever insurance policy you go with, read it. Because like I said, the insurance company's job is to get out of paying you. So you got to know exactly what is covered and how and what you need to provide in order to make sure that you're going to get your money back. One more question from Matt. Yeah. All right. Um, so when I left my nine to five, my parents were like, how are you? Brilliant. What are some of the ways that I recommend setting up for financial success down the road, saving for retirement when there isn't a company to match my 401k contributions? Start early and go hard. Those, that's my initial advice, right? Again, compound <laughs> growth. Start early, I'm out, and go hard. Oh, that's it, I'm screwed, I'm out. Damn it. <laughs> All right, if you're starting later, you gotta go harder. I'm just saying. Um, so, there are a lot of really interesting opportunities for saving in interesting ways. Uh, in the States, you have something called a Roth IRA. I only yeah. recently heard about this. This is magic. This is, I think you put money in, it, it, do you get a tax deduction for the money you put into a Roth IRA? No. no. It's after tax. It's after tax. It's out tax. It That's it. Tax okay, so it grows tax free. Imagine putting in 10 grand and then turning it into 100 grand, and then you can pull all that money out tax free. It's brilliant. <laughs> With the tax on the, on the, on the appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not the yeah. yeah. interest. The risk is that you're going to pull out no, some high no tax interest. points. So if you get it out right away, then you know what the tax rate is, and you know it because that's going to go out right away. So for me, Roth is always the better route. Yeah. Because they, the rate's always going everywhere. A hundred percent. So max that out every year. That's true. What are income limits? Under 150 yeah, yeah. if you're single, I think. So, Mac, here we go. You ready? Here it goes. 
find out <laughs> what a Roth IRA is and how you can maximize that. Okay, I have one. All right. Put, put everything. Max it out. Right, that's one way to do it. Uh, and that's one way to start early and go hard. That is probably the most tax preferred way that you can save for retirement as a self-employed person. Uh, but definitely there are other opportunities as well. I'm not familiar with U.S. tax law. So uh, what else should you do? Educate yourself and or get a financial planner and or get an accountant. These people are quarterbacks for you. They will have your back. Did you, all right, did you put, uh, did you put your service on what you can offer on that? All right, good, excellent. Everybody, find her. Emily and Kristen. Emily and Kristen, all right. See, look, in our own community, we've got an amazing set of resources, right? Use that, right? Network, find out what you need to know. Ask those questions. Thank you for asking that question because it's an excellent way to make sure that you are. And, and there are other people here, I won't single them out, who are well, and what you've just demonstrated is, is it's perfect. This is that fits into the pillars of financially sustainable travel, right? You make creative, conscious spending choices so you can balance your income with your expenses to sustain your lifestyle. And that's really important. So uh, I'll finish off with a story to that effect as well. I was chatting, it was probably about mm, 10 or so years ago. And I was, uh, it, was, it was in my 17, actually it must have been, oh God, for 12 or 13 years ago. I was chatting with Chris Gillibo, who is the man behind the World Domination Summit. Uh, many of you know who he is. And he and I were talking, we just finished our year end, you know, look back on what our year has been like and business planning for the forward. And, you know, we were chatting back and forth. And I said, hey, do you have any recommendations for me? He said, yeah, make more money. <laughs> and I, of course, was already in the midst of, you know, publishing my annual income and, and, and expense report, showing that this lifestyle is, is uh, financially sustainable. And I, and I took issue with that. I was like, hey, whoa, hold up a minute. I don't need to make more money. Right? If this is my cost of a lifestyle that is soul satisfying for me, then why would I make more money for the sake of making more money? Right? When my lifestyle changes and I want to do something different or I want to make different spending choices, then I have to make sure I have that money to be able to pay for that. So now I have a home base. Guess what? I've got to make a little more money if I want to travel for six months of the year and have a home base and all those expenses. That's fine. It's still financially sustainable travel. Money in, money out, creative conscious spending choices. Mm -hmm. And there is a thing called lifestyle inflation as well. Mm -hmm. You hit this point where, where I think there was a study done where once you make a certain amount of money, you like your, your happiness will go up as you make more and more money, but then there's this threshold you hit where actually once you tip over the other, the other side of that, your happiness does not proportionately increase to the amount of money you make. And I thought found this as well. When I was a financial planner and I hit six figures, I was like, I got this. Like, I'm in. I got a nice car. I live in a loft. I'm rubbing shoulders with cool people. I look like a million dollars. But hold on, wait a minute. I'm not actually taking any more money home than I was when I was earning like... 70, 80 grand. Why? Because my cost of living, the cost to earn that money had gone up. And I had assistance and higher insurance policies and bonds and this and that. And then of course I had to look the part, so I automatically spent more money on that. But I didn't get a proportional amount of enjoyment out of that extra income. And in fact, what I got was more stress. Now this is not to say that you should not earn six figures a year. Please go out and earn six figures. Earn seven figures. Go out there, do it. But be aware that there is a such a thing as lifestyle inflation. If you tackle your finances and your life and your financial plan, think of these guys in the Triangle of Freedom. What is it that you want? Reverse engineer from there. What do you want out of your life? What do you want out of your career? How do you want that to look? Reverse engineer that. Make sure that you're making enough money to pay for the lifestyle that you want. Make sure that your business looks like what you want and you engineer the rest of your life to get there. Choose one of those elements of the triangle of freedom and go it. Go for it. Go all in. And the other two elements of that triangle will definitely fall into place accordingly as long as you're conscious about it. So I know we have a million other people. I want to stay up here and talk to you about ATM strategies. I really, really, really do. But I'm around all day, so ask me. <laughs> All right. <laughs>